here to be able to present and talk and share a little bit what I've learned over the past few years. Um, and particularly, while I'm presenting from a COVID ICU uh, where I'm currently rounding, um, I think that the goal of this next 30 minutes will be to uh, present from a COVID free zone. So uh, sit back and relax and let's talk about sepsis resuscitation triggers, in particular, what's new in 2020. So the goals of today are fairly simple. We're gonna review these, um, review some updates in sepsis resuscitation, um, and we're gonna talk about two specific things. One of them being uh, the introduction of a concept called the diastolic shock index, and then turn that to not just the macro circulation, but the micro circulation, particularly perfusion with capillary refill time, and how you can incorporate this into your practice so that you can use it during your next shift to make a difference in patient care. So let's talk about a gentleman who I actually recently took care of in the emergency department. Um, this was a 38-year-old male who presented to the emergency department with fever, um, had fever for the past three days, um, had, was feeling a little bit fatigued, um, had temperature as high as 39, hadn't really had any respiratory symptoms though. Uh, he was not a PUI in the sense, um, did not have cough, shortness of breath. Um, the only thing, you know, he could think of that he's done recently as we we're going through the history was he had been to the dentist recently um, because he had a bad tooth. He had the, the um, ESI 5 dental pain that he came through our urgent care and uh, was uh, treated for. Um, but he did, in fact, have a fever and was tachycardic. And this was his initial blood pressure uh, when coming into the emergency department. So 98 over 35 with a map of 56. So a little bit concerning right off the bat. Um, definitely was uh, hypotensive and tachycardic. Uh, and again, he had no major past medical history, was an otherwise young, healthy 38 year old. And on his initial triage, um, he had gotten his vitals as well as uh, some lab sent because of his abnormal vital signs. And this was his uh, VBG. So his uh, pH was 7.28, his PCO2 was 22, and he had a base, base excess of minus nine. So I think we're all thinking he has a pretty significant metabolic acidosis. And as we go down the slip, we see that his lactate is six. So this patient is fairly sick. So I wanna to pose to you as a clinician in the room, you're gonna be asking your nurse to do a couple of different things, but what are the things initially that you're going to ask for? Obviously, I think um, we'd all be thinking large, uh, a large amount of IV access. This patient is likely critically ill. We're going to start some fluids, um, but then we have the question of if he responds, what are we going to do next and how much fluid to give? And so this is where the idea of triggers come in. Um, and so let's see how he responds. So he gets a little bit of fluid, and uh, while that's happening, uh, you are, uh, our ultrasound nerds are coming in the room and uh, taking a look, and this is what we see. Uh, I think all of us would agree that the right ventricle looks pretty small, left ventricle looks underfilled, um, certainly tachycardic, no pericardial effusion, nothing to necessarily explain his hypotension except maybe an underfilled heart. And we move down, we slide down to the um, IVC view. And yes, I know this is a long axis view, so don't, don't uh, yell at me. I promise this is accurate, um, that uh, this certainly is underfilled and there's a flat IVC, which to me, I'm always thinking, could this be hypovolemia or could this be a sign of vasoplegia? So one of the two, and I'm thinking given the history that maybe this is sepsis, so certainly a possibility of a vasoplegic state. So we give a little fluid, we look up at the monitor, and here's what our blood pressure is on serial measurements. We see a systolic that's um, over 100, but diastolic that's low, and his map is maybe a little bit lower. So what do we do here? What are we going to do? We're going to probably start with fluids, and you can see his repeat vital signs down here. And after the first 30 minutes of resuscitation, we check his lactate, and it's starting to trend down, but still pretty high. So we got uh, some decisions to make here. So we, are we going to give more fluids? He's gotten about 750 cc so far. Are we going to add on a vasopressor before that 30 cc per kilo bolus? Um, does he need a steroid vitamin C? Or you know what? We're not going to do anything because I don't even believe that lactate, which we're going to talk about later today. So my approach to shock, and I think uh, an evolving concept of management of shock involves assessing a couple of different things. Certainly the macro circulation. So we look up at the monitor and we see what those vital signs are, what the blood pressure is, 
um, and maybe even do an assessment of cardiac output using our ultrasound and VTI. Um, certainly that can give us a sense of, we can estimate what our systemic vascular resistance is um, and whether or not this is hypovolemia or vasoplegia. But then we also have to think about what's called the microcirculation. And this is what we care about most. This is the perfusion that's happening, the blood flow that's happening at the organ level. And this is the essence of shock management. It's getting tissue perfusion, not necessarily just fixing the numbers on the screen. Because at the end of the day, we really wanna reverse cellular hypoxia. So we wanna match the oxygen delivery to what the body needs in front of you and during this sepsis or stress state. And certainly in sepsis, we can have some element of impaired delivery and that's what happens when we improve blood flow, we reverse that. Um, but we also recognize that there is probably some degree of uh, impaired utilization um, and that's not for today. We're not gonna talk about mitochondrial dysfunction or anything like that in sepsis. We're gonna focus on what we know how to fix right now. So we have some decisions to make as a clinician, you're at the bedside, what is going to be your next step in managing this patient? And that's critically important. And I always like highlighting this article because it gives us a good sense of what happens as we delay certain critical decisions like deciding to initiate vasoactives to restore blood pressure and restore uh, perfusion um, particularly organ perfusion to our patients with sepsis. And it was, what this did was essentially looked at patients and stratified their mortality based on the timing of initiating vasoactives for patients who are hypotensive with septic shock. And what was pretty clear, I think, from this graph that shows that for every hour delay in norepinephrine administration to get patients to an adequate mean arterial blood pressure, the increase in risk or increase in mortality of these patients was a little over 5%. So this is emergency resuscitation, emergency medicine at its finest in having us make some really critical decisions up front at the bedside within the first three hours uh, to really try to get this patient heading in the right direction because certainly at the end of the day, the early decisions that we make are gonna define the trajectory of our patients. So we're, we're here to talk about triggers. So what is a trigger and how is it different from maybe something else? So I think of trigger as simply this. It's an instance or an observation uh, where a single or group of criteria met that lead to a specific action. And that's critical. And I think a lot of times we forget that about monitor, all these monitors, bells and whistles and everything is that those are great, but if it isn't met with an action or it doesn't lead to a specific action, at the end of the day, it's just worthless or maybe just a prognostic thing. And that's not what I'm here for. I'm trying to decide what I wanna do for my patient. So it's a little bit different from some of the other commonly used terms I think are thrown around in sepsis like resuscitation endpoint, a resuscitation target. Um, these are things that maybe uh, over the course of time of a series of actions we're going to stop at this point in time. This is something that's gonna define action in terms of what you're going to do uh, to take care of your patient further. So take a, take a walk back with me, and this is from 1967. This was the first time the concept of a shock index was actually described. And I think all of us maybe are familiar with this idea of the shock index or the term of shock index, which in 1967, as they went through a series of experiments, they found that as our systolic blood pressure lowered, as patients were hypovolemic, and in this case, they started, the ger these German authors here started with hemorrhagic shock they recognize that the patient's heart rate went up. And we all know that that's to essentially uh, improve our cardiac output here. So as our blood pressure, systolic blood pressure goes down, our volume status goes down, our heart rate's gonna kick up because remember, cardiac output is very simple of stroke volume times heart rate. So if one goes down, the other one has to go up. But um, the systolic blood pressure here is awfully important because we've gone through over the course of the years and applied this idea of the shock index to emergency medicine and specifically critical illness. And a few uh, researchers have looked back specifically in all comers with circulatory shock in trying to identify in the ED if we can use this to identify patients who are at high risk of not doing so well. And certainly it has uh, definitely 
raised itself as a flag for badness. And I think oftentimes we apply this for patients with um, you know, trauma, hemorrhagic shock, pre-intubation RSI. If that heart rate is above our systolic blood pressure, we kind of know that that patient's in trouble and that we really need to be conservative or thoughtful about how we're going to manage this patient's hemodynamics um, right a, initially as well as prior to doing any other interventions that could reduce the blood pressure further. But I think the idea that shock index is, is important is, is correct, and certainly a number greater than 0.8, so essentially heart rate greater than a systolic, is equal to um, not a good prognostic sign. Um, but in terms of sepsis, though, I think we need to be a little more thoughtful about how we apply it, right? So think about what happens with patients with septic shock. What actually happens? Why do they become hypotensive? Well, I think the simple concept here is if this represents our blood vessels, we vasodilate, right? And our intravascular volume in general doesn't change all that much. It's a relative hypovolemia. And with each heartbeat, certainly we can improve the blood pressure with those fluctuations in stroke volume, right? But as that uh, in between each beat, as the di we get back to our diastolic blood pressure, the relative hypovolemia becomes clear. And so what does that mean? Well, in patients with generally a healthy heart, their systolic blood pressure may appear okay, but it's their diastolic that tends to get lower as their vasoplegia gets worse with septic shock. And this is where malperfusion can be most profound in patients with sepsis. And so I think maybe the systolic shock index that we've used a long time for traditionally for all comers with circulatory shock may not be the right screening tool or maybe even trigger uh, for patients with sepsis. So this was a really, uh, in my opinion, an important article, an interesting article that came out this past year uh, defining something called the diastolic shock index, in particular relation to clinical outcomes in patients with septic shock. And this was written by uh, an author that we'll talk about um, another study that he, or another trial that he published over the past year, um, Glenn Hernandez and his group in South America. And what they did was uh, something really interesting. So they took a look at their Andromeda shock series, as well as they combined it with a cohort from an additional 20 ICUs in Brazil, as well as a number of other uh, countries in South America. And they combined them and looked at this concept of diastolic shock index. So remember, uh, the traditional shock index was defined as uh, heart rate over systolic, but recognizing that vasoplegia is the significant underlying pathophysiology in patients with sepsis, maybe it's the diastolic blood pressure that we have to be thinking about. And so they took half of the cohort from Andromeda shock and then added the second cohort of 761 total subjects. And as they looked at their early on, so within the first hour or pre-vasopressor uh, diastolic shock index, they recognize that a DSI greater than two, so if the heart rate is double the diastolic blood pressure, that was fairly significant screening tool to say this patient has pretty significant vasoplegia and is likely going to need ICU admission. Okay, but I just told you we we're going to be talking about triggers, not screening tools, right, or prognostic signs. And well, that's true. So how, do, how does this define an action that I'm going to make? Well, one of the real questions that we have right now in 2020 is when to initiate vasopressors for patients with sepsis. And currently the ongoing multi-center trial, the Clover's trial is still, is still in process and we'll be anxiously waiting the results of that trial. But they also took this a step further and said, well, how would this apply necessarily to early vasopressor initiation? And when they looked at patients with a low, or I apologize, a diastolic shock index greater than two, um, an early vasopressor administration within the first hour, um, what they identified was that the very early start of norepi with an initial diastolic shock index that was greater than two or 2.5 um, was associated with a fairly significant in, uh, decrease in mortality. So what does that mean to me? That means when I first walk into the room and I'm taking a look up at the monitor, if I see a low diastolic blood pressure, and remember, and this was something Amal always uh, said in, I remember in conference, was there's a reason why the diastolic blood pressure is counted twice in the map, right? It's twice as important because that's when all your organ perfusion is actually happening. Um, you know, when I see that low diastolic blood pressure, 
and particularly maybe even combined with a compensatory heart rate that's greater than two, that might be a trigger for me that I'm going to certainly give a little bit of fluid to match some of maybe the insensible losses and relative days uh, hypovolemia, but this patient's probably gonna need early norepinephrine. So I'm just gonna get that ordered so we can get that started and hopefully improve perfusion that way. But the next question and I think is appropriate is, what's the right number? Is there a number of diastolic blood pressure that I should be concerned about? And there's actually a little bit of data about this that's uh, fairly consistent with what we're seeing here uh, with the, um, the DSI study, is that a diastolic blood pressure less than 40 is a fairly good trigger for significant vasoplegia in sepsis and particularly venous maldistribution and unstressed intravascular volume. So that number of less than 40 is certainly something that's a red flag for me and a trigger that I need to start this patient on uh, early uh, vasoactives. So getting back to our patient here, we can see that if we take a look at his vital signs from presentation, followed by his follow-up vital signs, that initial fluid bolus improved his systolic blood pressure pressure, right? And remember, that just improved our stroke volume a little bit, right? So that's why our systolic blood pressure went up. But certainly that degree of vasoplegia isn't going to be affected at all by that fluid resuscitation. And his, his diastolic is still awfully low. And some people who might be satisfied with that systolic over 100, right, that you might hear in trauma um, and a few other, you know, critical care or critical illnesses, remember this is a different pathophysiology so that diastolic blood pressure is super important here and is still low. We need to reverse that with something that's going to tighten up our SVR. And so the question here then uh, I think all of us are asking is what to do next and we kind of just went over that. But um, some of us might be thinking prior to hearing this, you know, this patient's under resuscitated, the lactate is four, um, that's a bad sign, need to give more fluids, right? just give them more fluids, that lactate's gonna come down. Uh, we'll dilute that out or improve perfusion with IV fluids. Um, and some of us might be erring on the side of the lactate's a prognostic tool. It doesn't even really matter. It's gonna come down over time. And then maybe a few of us might say, did I meet step one criteria? Oh, I really can't get another email from my administrator. I can't, I, I, don't, I don't, what do we do? Well, let's, let's briefly, we're in June and uh, as, uh, Welcome to all of our interns in emergency medicine and our early fellows in critical care. It's always good to just go over some of the basics. And as we transition to thinking about perfusion, not just the macro circulation, this is going to be an important topic. So remember, a normal lactate in general is less than or equal to two. Anything more than that is now considered a sign of uh, organ malperfusion. And something that we need to be more thoughtful about. Location of measurement isn't critical. We can get it from a peripheral IV, which is nice, but it doesn't guarantee that we're getting adequate blood flow to our tissues, which is a vital thing that we need to recognize and reinforce on a regular basis. Um, certainly we need to be aware of something called cryptic shock. And uh, this was, came, comes from a paper um, that was uh, probably published about eight years ago now. The idea that if a lactate's high with reasonable or normal vital signs, this patient is still in trouble. And those patients with cryptic shock often have worse outcomes because we become reassured that that normal macro circulation or the blood pressure, the, the systolic blood pressure that's greater than 100 with a map of 60, 65, um, they're doing just fine. It's just going to take time. They often don't get as much attention as uh, maybe uh, some of our patients with profound hypotension or vital sign abnormalities. Um, and so this is a, a concerning patient here. And this involves some of the research that, you know, kind of I'm doing right now that pressure does not always equal to flow. And with sepsis in particular, we need to be careful because certainly macrocirculatory changes that we uh, start to see with our initial resuscitation don't necessarily translate to perfusion. And so if we take a look at this patient and we're thinking about perfusion from a clinical side, one of the things that um, you know, I still like to do is the first thing I do when I walk into the room is feel the patient's hands and feet. And here we have another patient here, uh, again, keying in on this low diastolic blood pressure here, lactate is six. What do you notice about this capillary refill time? Certainly if normal is less than three seconds or so, I would say this is pretty delayed and concerning finding uh, for this patient with a normal map, right? His systolic is okay, but that diastolic blood pressure certainly needs some attention.
And the idea that our peripheral perfusion over time with septic shock is separated from what happens in our uh, hemodynamics is a really important concept. Um, and if you're interested in that, this is a great article that is a nice review of this concept that normalized hemodynamics don't necessarily guarantee improved peripheral perfusion or organ perfusion. And so some of the research, as I mentioned, that I'm doing is looking at microcirculatory blood flow in patients with shock. And this is an example of a patient with a diastolic blood pressure that's low. And these are capillaries with red blood cells going through them. And we can image this in the sublingual space. And if we had the sense of normal capillary blood flow is uh, this rapid sort of movement of red blood cells through the capillaries where it's single blood cell space, we notice that there's some areas that are good and then we have some areas that aren't looking so good. This is kind of plugged and slow. Um, and this is uh, basically shows you what malperfusion looks like at the capillary level. And we have some areas here of what I said, like kind of stagnant and slow flow and other areas that there's an improved flow. And this is actually non-existent flow altogether. Here's another example of a patient who's 55 with a MAP of 65, who's already been started on pressors with sepsis. But again, the macro circulation, the hemodynamics might be normal, but certainly there's definitely more work to be done here. And this might mean, do we need a little bit more fluid? Is vasopressor, uh, is, not, is that not the right choice? Or maybe we need to think more about this patient shock. Do they have an underlying septic cardiomyopathy that we know happens in about 20% of patients? And their cardiac output's a little bit uh, inadequate for what they need right now. Do they need to be on an inotrope? So these are some of the questions that I think about. And just to highlight this, this was a great study and uh, our trial that was published just about a year ago. Um, and this was the Andromeda shock trial that thought about sepsis resuscitation just a little bit differently. And this was a multi-center superior trial where they looked at patients with septic shock defined by sepsis three criteria. It was 420, a little over 400 uh, patients who were randomized to a trigger of a capillary refill time or lactate to decide what to do next. The control was measuring lactate every two hours with a goal normalized by 20%. And the intervention arm was capillary refill, simple uh, bedside test. If it was greater than three seconds, it wasn't that they got more fluid. The question was, the trigger was, do an assessment to determine whether or not the patient needed more fluid, vasopressors, or an inodilator. So that's a really important uh, distinction in this study. It was not if capillary refill time delayed CRT led to fluid resuscitation. It led to an assessment of what the next step should be in managing of this patient. Now, the result here was no difference in mortality at 28 days. And so I think a lot of people took away, oh, well, there's no difference then, or that they're equal capillary refill time and lactate. But there's some important um, statistical results from this trial that, um, are highlight, that I'll highlight here, as well as a follow-up uh, study that's super important that came out just a few months ago. So mortality was about a little over 40% in the lactate group and 35% in the capillary refill time group. And so just missed statistical significance by 0, uh, at 0 0.06. So you might say, well, that's a pretty decent difference in mortality. So if it were me, I might want to be in that capillary refill time assessment of shock resuscitation group. Um, and if we look at some subgroup analyses for what it's worth, I understand subgroup, but they received less fluid in eight hours, less norepinephrine, and had a lower lactate uh, two or three days down the line. They also had lower organ injury scores at three days. And those are all really clinically meaningful outcomes, although not mortality. And there was no difference in mechanical ventilation, need for dialysis, and overall ICU hospital length of stay. So this came out just a few months ago, and why I want to highlight this is because that p-value of 0 0.06 and deciding on whether or not capillary refill time should be incorporated into your resuscitation strategy in patients with sepsis, this was a kind of a, um, a look through, uh, looked at capillary refill time and drama shock through a little bit of different lens. And in, with statistics, a lot of times we try to come up with a power analysis before we do this trial to understand what we think the difference is going to be in our two patient groups. But if we don't measure that or estimate that correctly, uh, we might end up with a negative trial, which is what some kind of happened here, despite being pretty close to statistical traditional frequentist uh, statistics. So what, what um, Fernando Zampieri is, who's a, a 
clinician researcher down in Brazil, was they took a look at this, um, this trial again through the lens of a Bayesian analysis. So what does that mean? It means what is my pretest probability that capillary refill time is going to be better than lactate as a, as a trigger for resuscitation? And I'm not going through statistical tests here, but what's kind of the takeaway of this um, is that with every kind of uh, grouping that they did for pretest probability that capillary refill time was better than lactate or whether it was equal to lactate, or maybe it wasn't that much better than lactate, they found that there was a more than 20% reduction in the odds of dying at 28 days. So that gives you a pretty significant signal here that capillary refill time is probably a good trigger to use over lactate. And I know um, we're gonna talk about lactate in a little bit, so I'm gonna segue into that, um, that talk uh, that you'll hear about a little bit later. But again, lactate is not necessarily a panacea for shock resuscitation or a trigger to give more fluids. Um, it should be a trigger or a sign to you that maybe something's not right. And capillary refill time, I think, should be integrated in our decisions about resuscitation, particularly a trigger to make a decision about what we should do next. And so going back to our patient, a blood pressure after a little bit of norepinephrine, we noticed that our systolic blood pressure didn't change all that much, but what changed? Our SVR got um, higher and that diastolic blood pressure came up and all of a sudden our capillary refill time got better. So they didn't get overly resuscitated with excessive fluids and crystalloid here. The recognition that the significant vasoplegia need to be addressed with the vasopressor kind of fixed this capillary refill time. And this is an example of a normal perfusion, what we should be seeing. Um, and this is someone with a diastolic blood pressure with sepsis of 60. And we can see lots of nice healthy capillaries here with lots of fast, brisk blood flow um, that's well perfused. So I think my take home points here are fairly simple. You know, resuscitation triggers are not endpoints. So as we start off walking in the room, we want to reverse the macrocirculatory hemodynamic things that we can get back to normal. And focusing specifically on the diastolic pressure, blood pressure is probably a good start. I don't think any trigger is necessarily perfect. All of them have flaws. And using one to guide resuscitation is probably the right thing to do. And certainly as we recognize that perfusion is not always tied to hemodynamics, particularly as septic patients get worse, it's important to one, reassess, and also um, use something like peripheral perfusion, capillary refill time as a perfusion measure to make sure that even though you've normalized those hemodynamics, that blood flow is reaching what we really care about, which is the end organs. So with that being said, um, I'm happy to take any, any questions in the last couple minutes. This is my email at Twitter. Please feel free to reach out if you have any questions. I'm always happy to talk shock, resuscitation, and it's an absolute honor to open up for this uh, in amazing lineup today. You guys are in for a real treat. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. That was an outstanding start for today. There are just a few questions as we're going to transition to Dr. Who. And one of those that came across the live stream chat was capillary refill with respect to older adults with comorbidities. How reliable is that? So that's a great question. Um, and, you know, one of the things I think uh, we need to remember is um, peripheral perfusion can be impaired, peripherally peripheral blood flow in elderly patients. One thing you can do, if you don't want to use the fingers, and certainly there's some temperature issues there, you can move to more proximally. So what I tend to do in my older patients, just as kind of we uh, tend to believe maybe our, our central arterial lines, um, those blood pressure on the screen, you can use the kneecap as, um, as a way to assess peripheral perfusion. And the kneecap actually gets is very sensitive for malperfusion. And if you press on it and hold it for about five to six seconds, uh, normal capillary refill time of the kneecap and leg is about five seconds. So if you're concerned that maybe there's some purple temperature issues or something that's making your fingertips not reliable, move a little bit more proximal to the, to the proximal leg and, and press down. And if it's greater than five seconds there, that's fairly reliable in this other otherwise maybe questionable patient group. Great. And then one other question. Uh, one of the listeners asked 
You mentioned cryptic shock, talking about lactate. What criteria do you use to identify somebody in cryptic shock? Yeah, so, um, so this is a patient with normal hemodynamics, so they may have um, a map of 65, and this is going straight from the Puskarich article in, I think it was 2012. Um, so a map of 65 um, with a lactate greater than four. So if your patient has a normal blood pressure, but a lactate that's still high, um, you know, particularly greater than or equal to four, that's who I would define as cryptic shock. Great. Well, thanks, John, so much for getting us off to a great start.